Okay, let's uh, turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 1. <coughs> on, the, uh, on the occasion of Mother's Day, we will do something very different today, uh, which is a tracing through of a character uh, that is very well known, but often not seen in the fullness of it. Um, so let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 33. We'll read responsively. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 33. Let me read verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto angel, okay, we'll stop there. Um, let's also read one more verse before we pray, and that is from Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. May the Lord bless this reading. Let's pray and ask of the Lord to minister his word this evening. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you that we can come around your precious word and desire our lives to be brought under the preaching and teaching of your word. Lord, we know that you have the words of eternal life and you alone can work in us by the power of your word in a manner that we would not go back from here the same as we have come. And Lord, we thank you also, Lord, uh, for the privileged portion of motherhood that you have given to uh, our moms and also the, those of the sisters here and those that are moms and would be moms. We ask that you would so, Lord, uh, continue to bless them and keep them and make them even more a, a blessing in the way that you intend uh, for their lives. Here, Lord, as we look at, uh, look at the life of Mary, we ask that you would uh, minister your word to me and to us that in and through the words of life that you give us, our lives may be built up and we might be given grace to be enabled to live out your word. To this end, Lord, bless our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know the moment we look at the life of Mary, we would have our, uh, our thoughts go to a Christmas time and a Christmas season. That's only when we usually try to look at the life of Mary. On another time, it would be on the crucifixion event when Jesus speaks to Mary and handles the responsibility of uh, her caretaking to his beloved disciple. But uh, as we walk through, uh, there are about 10 uh, snippets of events that are recorded with regards to the life of Mary, uh, of which all of them, uh, I wouldn't go in much detail, but only few of them, uh, maybe three or four, I would be 
in much more focus, uh, spend much more focused time, but the rest of the time we would just glean um, obvious principles uh, for our own lives. Now I've titled my message as Challenging Motherhood to Christ Discipleship. We would see that that is what Mary had been called to. And uh, before we go forward, I would want to recognize that uh, there are about six Marys in the scripture, especially at least six Marys in the scripture, in the, particularly through the New Testament time. And uh, this name Mary, it stands for uh, a, a number of things that you may be familiar with. The first one is that uh, it is a name that has uh, the Hebrew borrowing of the word called Mara, which we all are aware, called, it is, uh, it is, it is a word for bitterness. The, in and through the wilderness journey, the children of Israel have stopped by Mara, where the water was bitter, and Mary or Maria, uh, it comes from this word Mara or bitter, and uh, that's the meaning of this her name. Also, there is also uh, an other uh, extra biblical meanings of well-wished child. Um, so there are multiple meanings, but the most uh, well-known meaning is bitterness. And uh, well, um, the reason for Mary uh, to be such a, a challenging, uh, called for a, such a challenging motherhood is that we all would recognize very obviously that motherhood is a challenging call. Uh, it's, a, it's not a, a simple calling because there is this um, responsibility and sacrificial l outliving that we all are aware of. As much as motherhood is a privilege, we also see that it is a challenging call that God has given upon those that receive it. And so, when we look at it, I would certainly say much more than the normal motherhood, Mary has an immense, exponentially greater challenging life before her. Uh, we would try to take a look at that uh, in some ways as to why that is the case. But let me just give you that uh, the life of Mary as seen, recorded in the scriptures is uh, is confined to the gospel accounts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and beyond that only till Acts, and after that or before that we won't see this name, uh, except in Romans chapter 16, we will come to see a reference by Paul in verse 6 about a Mary that sh he greets, who is one who had worked hard among you. Apart from that, it is confined to the gospel accounts, and to the book of Acts chapter 1 that we are seeing there um, and some portions of Acts. Now, the reason I want us to walk through the life of Mary is that if there is one aspect of motherhood that is most misunderstood, it is the life of Mary. Primarily because Mary's life is either exponentially elevated to a divine status, sadly, to distort the truth that is in the scriptures, or it is not at all given its due place in neglecting in the way that she ought to be seen. The challenge that Mary has is immensely, uh, exponentially greater because she is to live with somebody who is living out perfect righteousness. And uh, when we look at the life of Jesus Christ, who is the very Word of God personified, Word of God made flesh, and when we look at the, the picture uh, word descriptions with regards to God's Word, God's Word is like a mirror. It shows us exactly how you and I are in our lives. And uh, just imagine living with Jesus Christ in the same, uh, in the same home under the same roof. You and I are tremendously exposed to how you look, how you are behaving, how you are living, as you are living with somebody who is perfect to the core. 
And uh, that is an immense challenge that Mary was called to live up to. And we need to recognize that. And uh, of course, as much as it's a challenge, it is an immense privilege as well, as we see in the first instance of the snippet of Mary's life brought to us through the recording of Luke, here in chapter 1, verse 26, Luke begins to give a detailed account of how God happened to visit, uh, God happened to send his message through his, his angel Gabriel in wanting to remind uh, Mary as the one who is chosen to bring the Savior to this world. You know, that is the season and the time where these uh, Hebrew uh, girls were waiting and desiring that it would be they that would ch be chosen to bring the Savior into the world. In, in, in the time and the seasons of immense oppression by the Roman Empire, they were looking to God in deep cry, asking that God would send the Messiah who would come. And so there were many who came about calling themselves as Messiah in the time of Jesus. But it was Mary who was chosen to have this immense privilege of giving birth to God incarnate. And so here in verse 26 onwards, we see Gabriel comes and visits the city of Nazareth, uh, in a city of Nazareth, city of Galilee named Nazareth. And then he goes about to give this news to Mary and says in verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. You know, this word hail is so well known in some circles as with regards to the worship that is, and it is borrowed from here. This hail is a greeting word. It is just like uh, hi that we use today. And in fact, or in a better, uh, hi is more of an uh, unofficial one, but hail is something where it's a good greeting that we would say. And uh, thou that art highly favored, and in fact, Mary was a one who is highly favored of God. God has been pleased to choose her, to choose, choose her to bring her son, his son, into this world through her. And so, and the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. She is somebody who is recognized to be a God-fearing lady, uh, who the Lord is with and who is blessed who is favored of the Lord. And then, as she was troubled, the angel said in verse 30, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, verse 31, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And then it goes about to say, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And so, we recognize that this promise that the angel reminds is the Davidic covenant promise where God's going to establish his throne through the Messiah that is going to come. And so in verse 33 we read, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall there, and his kingdom there shall be no end. And so we come to see how the messianic prophecy is being reminded and uh, in, the ch in the child that she is going to receive. And uh, very clearly, there is this immense privilege of being chosen to be the mother of Messiah. And although it is this great privilege, she actually goes about to say, how is it that it would happen? And because she is a virgin, and in verse 34, Mary asked this question. And the angel, we all know, clarifies in giving that the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And so it would be a immaculate or a conception out of a miracle that the son whom she will bear would not have the the fallen nature of a Adam as it is being passed down. And so sometimes we might think that it is only through Adam that that uh, fallen nature is passed down and uh, we would understand that the seed of the woman is, is, is something that is so holy 
But the, the point is that God has done enough to preserve the tainting of sin in the conception of Jesus Christ. That whether it be Adam or Eve or whether it be Mary or any uh, human intervention, he has preserved the, this seed to be untainted by sin so that it could be a holy sacrifice that he would come to offer when he does so on the cross of Calvary. And so when we recognize this, it is to be recognized that there is this immense privilege that she has been chosen to be the one who would bring forth the Savior into this world. And uh, we would see on a number of occasions beyond here that Mary treasures this in her heart. As the shepherds come and declare what they have heard, they, they declare what God had given through the angelic visitation that today in the city of David a Savior is born unto you. And as she hears that in Luke chapter 2, we would see that she treasures that in her heart in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 19. But was chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. In verse 19 it says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. There is a treasuring of this immense uh, privileged portion that she is being part of in that choosing. And yet, with that privilege comes the... The other side of the coin, which is the rejection. Had it been all good, we would, uh, we would be rejoicing with her. But soon, very soon, we see in verse uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, that just as she was receiving this conception through the supernatural work of God, we see that there is this rejection was also up... Uh, for her in Matthew chapter 1 verses 19 to 25 we note that Joseph her husband being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. There is this facing of rejection during uh, her conception and pregnancy time that she has to endure the moment she receives Christ into her womb. And so when we receive Christ, it is not going to be a, a, a bed of roses. It's not a piece of cake. Christian life is not a promising of prosperity, wealth, health, and uh, goodness of God alone. But also, there are uh, temptations and trials that are part of this calling of a Christian life. And that's why in Philippians chapter 1, verse 31, verse 30, we read, uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake and so here Christian life is also not just trust trusting in receiving this great salvation but also willing to be able to suffer and face rejection the moment you and I are brought to the fold of Christ, there is this whole world that rises up to begin to reject you as you are not going to be one among them anymore. And so we see that clearly in this relationship uh, effects that have come in the life of Mary. As I say, the second uh, snippet of the event that is recorded by Matthew this time is that she faces the challenge of rejection by her own uh, fiancé in, in how she was betrothed to Joseph. And so we see how God comes into intervention in dealing with the crisis that Mary is to face in sending an angel and visiting Joseph and revealing to Joseph the planned purpose that God has through, through the son that God was to bring about through Mary. And so when we take note of it, we ought to remind ourselves that there is going to be a rejection as we walk a Christian walk. And if not, we should be surprised. If not, we should be questioning ourselves. If not, we should be mindful as to where we are in our walk with God. And so we are called to be examining our hearts even in this 
aspect of our lives. And so moving on, we see the third aspect that we see. I won't uh, go much detail in the second one of the facing of rejection, but let's move to the third one. As we see in the continuation of Matthew chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, the enduring of hardship through the early infanthood. Mary was given the immense privilege of becoming Messiah's mother. She's also given the portion of facing rejection during the carrying of the Messiah, but also she's given the, the aspect of enduring hardship through the early infanthood. In Matthew chapter 2, we all know that Jesus was visited by the Magi from the east to worship uh, this new king of Jews who was to be born. And as, the, as these mag Magi re retreat uh, after worship, we note that they go back on another route, not giving the information to Herod. And we read in verses 11 onwards, verses 12, and being warned of God in the dream that they should not return to Herod, they return into their own country another way. In verse 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take, your, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou that there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Her life and the life of her son is at risk and uh, she has to endure that hardship on fleeing from here and there running around to preserve and uh, we see that enduring of hardship is a reality of Christian life not just as a rejection from the world but there are trials and hardships that you and I would have to endure as we walk our Christian life now moving forward quickly we'll go, go to the fourth one which is in Luke chapter 2, verse 41 and 50, we come to this um, interesting phase of the life of Jesus during his early childhood. Uh, we note that the scripture gives us about 12 years of Christ's childhood. Um, and even in that account, it gives us certain instances in much detail where at the age of 12, Jesus, along with his parents, had gone to Jerusalem as the custom was every year uh, during the festival. And as they were returning, we read in verses 41 onwards, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, and as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not. We all understand how they go about three days journey and recognize and come back and find Jesus talking with and asking questions and answering them in verses 46 and 47 we read and it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors both hearing them and asking them questions and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And verse 48, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. In verse 49, Jesus gives another startling statement. It is, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Right from his childhood, we come to see that not just the wisdom that marvel the, the wise men and those that are in temple, we see that Jesus brings about a correction of purpose for his life right in his childhood, that he sets the understanding clear. He has come into this world to be on his father's business. And uh, although he is not yet there, we see that the parents had to learn having known that he is not somebody who was naturally born to them, was given to them to be the Messiah, to be the Savior, they were given this caring responsibility and when they come to recognize that he was not with them, they come and in amazement ask, how come you have done this to us? And they come under the correction of his 
in the purpose for why he is come into this world many times our lives at times need that correction where we might be so lost in living out our lives for our own selves for our own family for our own uh, purposes missing out for the heavenly purposes for which you and i have been called we read as we come to know christ we read this verse but we soon forget matthew 6 verse 33 seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you we recognize that we have come to know christ we've been regenerated now that we are in christ we think that we can detract from that purpose but we see christ bringing about a correction of that purpose for which he is living even as parents of christ they were to be receiving that correction of purpose that he is this he is here with this immense purpose to establish the kingdom of god upon this earth and he has to be on the father's business and so many times we give what is left out to god in fact we are give we are to give what is right out to god that is we are not to be giving our leftovers to god leftovers are for ourselves and not for god and whether whatever is the leftover of time whatever is the leftover of our savings or whatever we don't do that also <laughs> whatever is the leftover of uh, of our energy maybe sometimes our old age or sometimes uh, later years of our lives we would want to serve god and not yet but the lord says there is a correction of purpose that we see that the parents have been brought under may it be so that we constantly check as to this high calling that god has given to us things that are temporary things that are seen are temporary things that are eternal are unseen as we read in second corinthians chapter 4 we come to this last statement in verses 16 17 and 18 for which cause we faint not but through our outward man though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day one of the express purpose for a christian life's calling is that our inward man ought to be renewed day by day it is not month by month it is not year by year although we check at at some milestones but we are called to be renewed on a day to day basis for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen many a times things that are seen are the ones that we run after more and things that are not seen things that are not uh, eternal things that are eternal are, are given secondary uh, importance at times and so we do need that correction of purpose for our lives and so as we come to this fourth uh, the, the fifth one we come to see in the life of jesus luke chapter 2 verses 51 and 52 that although jesus clarifies the pur- and gives them the correction of purpose we see that jesus was subjective to his parents in and through the uh, in and through the years of his life in verses 52 and 51 and 52 and he went down with them and came to nazareth and was subject to them but his mother kept all these things sayings in her heart again we note that same uh, treasuring of what what christ is doing not just in his conception in in he being conceived not just in his infancy not just in his childhood but through and through there is this tracking of what she comes to see constantly in and through this precious son this immense privilege of being able to live under the same roof of this great savior and lord that our lord jesus christ is see and and yet he being god the messiah that he would be he subjected himself to the parents as he did so in verse 51 in verse 52 and jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with god and and man and so here this is one some summary statement of his childhood beyond 12 years that he continued to grow in favor of god in favor of man many a times one question that 
skeptics usually come about to ask is that what happened between the 12 and 30 years of his life? There is nothing that is recorded. Maybe Jesus might have sinned. Maybe Jesus had done something else and uh, which is not worth noting, which is why the authors have skipped. But as a summary statement, we see it very clearly that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and favor with man. He cannot increase in favor with God unless he is living a sinless life as he was born sinless and had been living out in, in and through his infancy. And so we also see the author of Hebrews, inspired by the Holy, Holy Spirit, he writes, uh, that he was tempted just like you and me. Instead, we might think that Jesus had a perfect setting of home whereby he never had to sin. And uh, unlike that, we see as opposite is true that he had the most limited resources in his life with bare minimum things and with a fallen brothers and sisters in his home along with his mother and that he has to live with and was tempted like every way like you and me and yet was without sin as we read in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 we read for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin and so we are guaranteed to take note of how Christ lived a sinless life through the years of both uh, of all the 33 and a half years and between the years of 12 and 30 as well and so uh, we don't have to give in to the skeptics argument but be clear that he increased in favor with God and he lived yet without sin in the midst of temptations like every day that you and I face and so when we look at that we also have to take note that as he grew to be subjected to the home he was also responsible enough to take up, to address the needs of the family. We note that Mark chapter 6 verses 1 to 6 talks about the rejection of his own um, village or his own city with regards to his prophetic ministry or with regards to his ministry. And as they, as they reject, they have some comments to, for us to recognize. Mark chapter 6 verse 1 onwards. Let's read verse um, 4. Mark chapter 6. Verse 3. Let me read that. Um, verse 1 and 3. And he went out from thence and came into his own country and his disciples follow him. And then we all understand on the Sabbath day as he s stood up in the synagogue to teach, they were astonished as to how he had got such wisdom and how such mighty works were being done by him. And then they go about to give a phrase and a comment which gives us a glimpse of what Christ was up to between the years of 12 and 13. And that is in verse 3, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? That gives us a clue to go in line with the historians who say that in his early childhood his father soon passed away and so is it that that's why that he soon became that carpenter taking up the needs of the family upon his own shoulders to bear about for the family and work for them and so that's why in verse 3 we read is not this the carpenter how can a carpenter have such wisdom where did he have his education? There is no education that he has. There is no uh, teacher like Gamaliel or s someone who is known, who have taught him of all these great things that he speaks. And so they were astonished at his teachings and his mighty works. And so that gives us a picture of how Christ was a responsible son. When his father has passed away, he was watching over for the needs of the family. And so when we take a look at this, we see that Mary knew how responsibly he was working for the needs of the family tirelessly and he was still and that's why he was growing in the favor of God and also in the favor of men as he worked for others in doing whatever he did there is a favor of man that was upon him 
And so we see that there is this watching over of the needs of the family that Christ demonstrated in his life. And so when we see that many a times, uh, when I think about this particular condition that Mary is in, from the perspective of Mary, we see that Mary is in tremendous pressure situation where she has to see how she can take care of the needs of the family because her husband is no more there and she has to not just take care of the family but maybe cook and take care of these little brothers and sisters that Jesus had. And Jesus comes along to do what was necessary to take care of their needs. And uh, when we take note of that, we have to be mindful that there is this special calling of fatherhood that we come along uh, the side of the mothers who have greatest impact on the, sin, on the kids. Uh, but we are to come along their side to do our part. Many a times it is left to them that you deal with the kids. You raise them up. You discipline them. All the hard works are all given to the, to the mothers and then the, uh, the work of enjoying them, the work of cuddling them, the work of uh, 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 just playing with them is, le- is, is taken up by the dads. But not so, we are not to be such uh, fathers where uh, when we think about the diaper changing or when we think about any kind of uh, hard works that all uh, lovingly are done by mothers, we are to take that equal responsibility in disciplining them and uh, making the kids understand that both the, f- both the parents are taking their share in raising them up in a godly way and not, not just one-handed way where Mary has to endure that. And so when we take a look at this, here Jesus was stepping up to a higher responsibility in taking care of the family needs. As we read in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Here, there's these strong words that Paul wants, that many, in the name of God, in the name of ministry, in the name of many other things, with regards to uh, offering, as a, offering their life as a gift to the service of God, they are depriving the family of the basic necessities where Paul begins to warn them and he says, if any provide not for his own, especially for, their, for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So harsh words there. And so there is this responsibility of the family that you and I are part of that we are called to bear the needs, take care of the needs. And uh, Jesus was doing so, and Mary was mindful of that. And so when we continuing on that, the rest of it are very quick. Let me walk through John chapter 2. We come to this as Jesus grows up and begins his ministry. We all know that there's this one account where Jesus, as he began his ministry, then the first miracle that he did, that at the wedding of Cana, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was along with Jesus and uh, was bringing forth a request to Jesus on the need that was lacking uh, at the wedding there. And we all understand that conversation where Mary says to the servants, listen to him and do what he says. Jesus was uh, able and Mary recognized in how Jesus was able to handle the need handle the need of that hour there. And so that's why Jesus responds to the words of Mary and he says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. That is, he does his work in his perfect time, not at our timing, but in his time. And did, he did so in the exact time. And uh, as the servants were uh, asked to listen to Jesus, And so was the first miracle that was done where we read in verse uh, 10 and say unto him, uh, actually verse 11, this beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. This is probably the first uh, recording of the event. And take note that Mary recognized that he is able to handle uh, that 
that which is impossible at such a need, uh, at, such a, uh, at such an event where everything is done out, uh, is, is done away with. Now, let's move on uh, to Matthew chapter 12. We'll focus on this and the last one after this. But let's take a look at Matthew chapter 12, another event where Jesus comes to face uh, the coming over of, of his mother and of his brothers. We all know that Jesus was fully into the ministry by then, where his brothers have grown up enough to take care of the family needs. And it is at that time, at the age of 30, that Jesus begins his ministry as a, as a young man in, in the Jewish culture is set free to do whatever his calling is, whatever his, uh, his, uh, his passion is. And so was he, uh, according to the business of his father, he was given this calling to, to bring forth the kingdom of God and to, uh, and to atone for the sins of mankind. And in the midst of that ministry, the brothers of Jesus who had no uh, belief on his ministry and his work and his messianic, uh, messianic state, we see that they come along with dragging their mom to call his elder brother back home so that he along with them can work and do the menial work of physical work than the spiritual ministry or the ministry that Christ had been doing. And so Matthew brings to us in Matthew chapter 12, let's read verses 46 onwards. While he yet talked to people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak within, with him. Then one said to him, behold, thy mother and thy brother, brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. And then we all understand the response that Christ gives. But he answered said, and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And uh, certainly this seemed like a rude statement that Jesus had made against his mother. But much more than that, he was wanting to recognize the importance of, of trusting and living the word of God and being discipled, as we see here. He turns to his disciple and says, ye are my family. And yet after that, in Luke, chap Luke chapter 8, we see in a parallel passage that he did go to and talk to his uh, mother and his brothers. But it is not a rejection of them but it is a reminder for them that they ought to be coming under the discipling work of the word of God rather than keeping themselves apart. And so when we look at this, we see that the pursuing of Jesus during his ministry is what Mary was after. Mary was after, Mary and his brothers were after. And uh, although reluctantly, Mary was probably dragged along with his, uh, with the brothers of Jesus because we read in John chapter 7 that it is these brothers who didn't believe in Christ and uh, who were mocking in in the ministry calling that he had in John chapter 7 verse uh, verse verse 1 um, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren said, therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also see the works of that thou doest. And uh, here in verse 5 we read, For neither did his brethren believe in him. And so here, apart from his own uh, village, even his brethren didn't believe in him. But Mary was not yet there to give over uh, the, all that she treasured in her heart. And that's why Luke gives us the right picture that there is this, uh, there is this consideration of how Mary was walking uh, 
even afar off, uh, but because of the family restrictions, she was taking care of the rest of the brothers in taking care of their daily needs. And now, coming back to the last two things here, uh, we all know in John chapter 19 that at a time at, of his crucifixion, Jesus, uh, he brings about the handing of the responsibility to his beloved disciple, especially with regards to his mother. With regards to his mother in John chapter 19 verses 25 and 27, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Here is this verse that gives us many Marys for you if you are uh, a student of God's word. First is Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is Mary, the wife of Cleopas, who is different from Mary, the mother of Jesus. We also have Mary Magdalene here. We also are aware of Mary, who is of Bethany the sister of Martha and Lazarus, right? So they, there are about four Marys that are seen already. And Acts chapter 12 talks about Mary of Jerusalem, who is different. Um, and then again, Ma Romans chapter 16 verse 6 talks about the sixth Mary who, whom Paul greets. Now, having looked at all these, we see Jesus was handing out the responsibility of of, her, of his mother to his beloved disciple. We see that in the midst of the agony and the pain and the sacrifice that, and the atoning work, Christ was not um, shying away from his own responsibility. And so when we see that he was handling the responsibility well, even at, 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 at the point of his death. Now, moving uh, beyond, we see in Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15 verse 47 and Mark chapter 16 verse 1 that Mary also apart from being part of the handing of responsibility at the cross she was partaking in the post resurrection uh, events. Mark chapter 16 verse 1 that at, on the day of resurrection when uh, Mary Magdalene was going about to the tomb Mary the mother of James and Joseph that is his brothers was also going along with her. In Mark chapter 16 verse 1, we note that Mark records that for us. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, that is the brother of Jesus, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And uh, she was there at the resurrection, post, uh, at the um, post-crucifixion events. And so, Beyond that, at, at the last, we come to see in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, with this, we'll take note of one quick application and then close. Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we all understand that beyond the post-crucifixion and resurrection events, there is this event of Pentecost to which all the disciples, the 11, uh, and along with that, there were 120, in which we see in Acts chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. And when they were come in, that is to Jerusalem, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Aliphas and Simon Zeli Zeli Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. In verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. You see that Mary's life, as the last recording of her life, ended up in being part of the account of disciples. Those that received the birthing of the church through the giving of or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And as the church was birthed, she was part of that uh, discipling work that God was doing through this one living entity called the church that God has established. There are many parachurch organizations that God may help us to be encouraged, but there is only one 
living organization to whom that Jesus has given not just this promise but this but this power where he says I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it God has given that calling and this promise and also this power to this one living entity that he's building that is called the church where you and I are called to be discipled. It is in the body of Christ that you and I are going to be changed into the likeness of Christ altogether, not individually. We all are members of the body of Christ and he is the head and we are daily to be renewed and transformed into the image of Christ. And uh, although Mary's life uh, account, the gospel narratives begin with a challenging motherhood, her life has ended up in Christ discipleship. And so our lives, as we look at, we are called to be enduring in this discipling uh, of our lives where you and I are daily being changed into his, his, into his image. And if that is not happening, uh, our lives will be lived out only for the physical purposes, but not beyond that. And it is Christ who was with her through her life and this and also beyond her life where in the post resurrection events he gives to her the spirit of God to be indwelling permanently in the midst of the body of Christ that he uses all these means of grace to work that discipling work. And so when we read this you and I are called to take note of this exhortation that Paul gives in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 it says wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to his good pleasure God desires that as Mary was not just strengthened in the physical presence of Christ but beyond that as well in his absence of physical presence we see that she was able to work out her salvation in fear and trembling in that discipling work that God was doing in her that as we read in verse 13 it says for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure may that be of your life and mine that every challenging calling that you and I have been given whether it be as mothers whether it be as fathers or whether it be as co-workers or employers or employees or for that matter even a smallest of responsibility and calling you and I are to be in that calling with the dual aspect of Christ discipling so that Christ would be formed in us and that his purposes will be fulfilled in us and through us amidst God's people. May that be so of your lives and mine as we take note of the life of Mary this very day. Take a moment in the light of God's word as you close your eyes and join with me in this closing prayer that we might ask for our own lives as to how our lives are being lived out in the calling that he has given to us. And are they being lived out in his enabling? That is essentially what discipling is all about. That he enables us what we in our own strength, and strength cannot be living out. And so may you and I experience his enabling and discipling so much so that Christ would be formed in us and through us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you this evening, this privilege you give us to come around your precious word and consider the life of Mary and to also take note of all that you have done in her and uh, in and through her life, all that you are bringing to us this evening. Truly, Lord, our lives are bestowed upon with a high calling and uh, we are called to live out with your name upon our lives help us to live worthy of that high calling 
and that uh, our lives would be would be like little Christ showing forth the reality of Christ in and through us in every walk of our lives in every place that we live may Christ be real dear father that as many that would see our lives would come to see you through us and so lord uh, strengthen us enable us by your word and by your spirit we thank you we praise you for this day thank you for allowing us to come and uh, once again thank you for our moms and all the dear ones here lord uh, both moms and would be moms we ask that you would bless them specially and may it be so that we do our part in uh, in enabling them to live out this high calling that you have given them we thank you we praise you in jesus precious name we pray amen now may